Anti-diabetic medications are used to treat diabetes mellitus, a condition characterized by high glucose levels in blood. In healthy individuals, blood glucose level is tightly regulated by the hormones insulin and glucagon secreted by the pancreatic endocrine cells. As a quick review, type 1 diabetes commonly starts during adolescence. Here, the pancreatic beta cells are unable to produce enough insulin. Therefore, these individuals suffer from absolute insulin deficiency, and they are treated with lifelong insulin injections. By contrast, type 2 diabetes typically starts in middle ages. In these individuals, beta cells produce enough insulin, but the peripheral cells do not respond as well to it, leading to insulin resistance. These people are usually treated with oral anti-diabetic medications. However, with time, these individuals may also require insulin therapy, depending on how well the blood glucose levels are maintained. So, in this video we are going to discuss about oral anti-diabetic medications that are mainly used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Oral hypoglycemics are mainly used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. However, the first-line treatment of type 2 diabetes is lifestyle changes such as regular exercising and dietary modifications. If these interventions fail to lower the blood glucose levels, then the patient will be started on oral hypoglycemic agents, which have one or more of the following pharmacological actions. Increase pancreatic insulin secretion. Reduce hepatic glucose production. Increase insulin sensitivity in peripheral tissues. Reduce gastrointestinal glucose absorption. Or reduce renal tubular glucose reabsorption. Anti-diabetic agents can be classified broadly into insulin secretagogues and non-insulin secretagogues. Insulin secretagogues induce pancreatic insulin secretion. These medications include sulfonylureas, meglitinides, and incretin-based drugs, including GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors. Non-insulin secretagogues have various mechanisms of action. And these medications include biguanides, thiazolidine diones, alpha-glucositis inhibitors, amylin analogs, and sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors. First let's discuss about non-insulin secretagogues. Under this, we had biguanides, which includes metformin, the first-line treatment option for type 2 diabetes mellitus, after initiating the lifestyle changes. Its main mechanism of action is to reduce hepatic gluconeogenesis by activation of adenosine monophosphate-activated protein kinase, or AMPK. Following administration, metformin inhibits the mitochondrial respiratory chain complex in the cells, leading to decreased ATP levels. This results in the activation of AMPK, which is a key regulator of energy homeostasis within the cells. Activation of AMPK increases the overall cellular catabolism and reduces cellular anabolism. It reduces hepatic gluconeogenesis by inhibiting genes responsible for the synthesis of PEP carboxykinase and glucose 6-phosphatase, which are key enzymes in the gluconeogenesis pathway. It also increases glucose uptake in the peripheral tissues by inducing translocation of GLUT4 into the cell membrane. In addition, AMPK increases fatty acid oxidation, decreases glycogen, protein, fatty acid, and cholesterol synthesis, decreases intestinal absorption of glucose, and reduces LDL cholesterol while increasing HDL cholesterol, which ultimately reduces the risk of cardiovascular events in type 2 diabetics. Most of the time, treatment of type 2 diabetes is started with metformin alone. Later the disease, metformin is given in combination with other oral hypoglycemic agents, or insulin. It is available in immediate and slow-release formulations, and is also used in the treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome and gestational diabetes mellitus. If we take pharmacokinetics of metformin, it has an oral bioavailability of 50 to 60 percent and very low plasma protein binding. Duration of action is 6 to 8 hours. Metformin is not metabolized in the liver and excreted unchanged in urine via tubular secretion. Therefore, metformin is contraindicated in renal failure. Now let's see some common side effects of metformin. 
This drug is usually well tolerated by most individuals. Weight loss is the most common adverse effect. Gastrointestinal disturbances such as abdominal discomfort, nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea may occur in some individuals. In addition, anorexia and metallic taste are some other side effects. Hypoglycemia does not occur with metformin. Lactic acidosis is a rare but serious side effect of metformin, especially in patients with hepatic and renal failure. Lactic acid is a product of anaerobic respiration of the cells. Usually, this lactic acid is taken up by the liver and utilized in the process of gluconeogenesis. However, as metformin inhibits gluconeogenesis, excess lactic acid is excreted mainly by the kidneys. If an individual with renal impairment takes metformin, lactic acid tends to accumulate within the blood, causing serious complications. Therefore, metformin is contraindicated in patients with hepatic and renal failure. Next up we had thiazolidine diones, also known as glitazones. These medications include pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, which are insulin sensitizers similar to metformin. They act as agonists for a nuclear receptor known as the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, or PPAR gamma for short. Normally this receptor is activated when ligands such as free fatty acids bind to it. Once this happens, PPAR gamma diffuses into the nucleus and binds with another receptor, known as the retinoid X receptor. This complex is then able to regulate the transcription of many insulin-responsive genes. In particular, it increases the insulin sensitivity in muscle and adipose tissue by increasing the expression of GLUT4. It also reduces hepatic gluconeogenesis by down-regulating the expression of certain enzymes. Moreover, it regulates fatty acid metabolism by reducing triglyceride levels and increasing both LDL and HDL cholesterol, which leads to weight gain and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. As these medications are involved at gene transcription level, it takes up to one to two months to achieve the desired blood glucose levels. If we take pharmacokinetics, these drugs have a good oral bioavailability. And about 99% of the drug is plasma protein bound, therefore the onset of action is slow. Plasma half-life is 3 to 4 hours. Metabolized by the liver into active metabolites, with 70% of them excreted in bile and the remainder in urine. Most common side effect of glitazones is weight gain. They also cause fluid retention and edema, which may worsen the symptoms of heart failure, especially with concurrent insulin therapy. In addition, glitazones cause osteopenia and fractures in bones. The drug rosy glitazone is not used now because it is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events, such as myocardial infarction and stroke. Pioglitazone is also associated with an increased risk of bladder cancer. Moreover, these medications may increase the risk of hepatitis and liver failure. Therefore, liver enzymes should be monitored closely. Third group of non-insulin secretagogues was alpha-glucositis inhibitors, which includes the drugs acarbers and miglitol. Alpha-glucositis is an enzyme found in the brush border of small intestine, and it breaks down complex carbohydrates like starch into their simpler monosaccharide units, like glucose, which is eventually absorbed into the blood. Alpha-glucositis inhibitors prevent this process, and they delay the breakdown of carbohydrates. This ultimately lowers the postprandial blood glucose levels. They can be used alone or can be combined with other oral anti-diabetic agents. Unlike the other two classes of drugs we discussed so far, alpha-glucositis inhibitors can be used to treat both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Common side effects include GI disturbances such as gas, bloating, and diarrhea. And very rarely, hepatic damage. Next up we have amylin analogs. Amylin is a peptide hormone secreted alongside insulin by the pancreas. Amylin lowers blood glucose level by delaying gastric emptying, inhibiting glucagon secretion, and improving satiety. Amylin analogs are structurally similar to amylin and have the same effects on carbohydrate metabolism. Pramlantide is the main drug in this class. Unlike the other drugs we've discussed so far, 
Pramlantide is an injectable medication, not an oral one. And it can be used to treat both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Common adverse effects include nausea and increased risk of hypoglycemia, especially when taken with insulin. The last class of medications in non-insulin secretagogues are sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors. They include canagliflozin and apagliflozin. SGLT2s are located in the proximal convoluted tubules of the nephron and are responsible for about 90% of the glucose reabsorption. By inhibiting these transporters, these drugs significantly reduce the glucose reabsorption and promote glycosuria. These drugs are not associated with the risk of hypoglycemia. Most often, they are combined with other oral agents. And they promote moderate amount of weight loss. Common side effects include increased risk of urinary infections, hypotension due to increased fluid loss along with glucose, and moderate increase in LDL cholesterol, especially with canagliflozin. Now let's discuss about the insulin secretagogues, which promote insulin secretion from the pancreas. Under this category, first we have sulfonylureas. Following administration, sulfonylureas bind to the sulfonylurea receptor subunit of the ATP-dependent potassium channels in the pancreatic beta cells. By binding, they block this potassium channel, and as a result, potassium accumulates within the cell, leading to depolarization of the beta cell membrane. Then the voltage-gated calcium channels will open up to permit influx of calcium, which in turn causes activation and exocytosis of insulin-containing granules within the cell. In addition to this, sulfonylureas have extrapancreatic actions as well. They increase insulin receptors on target cells, inhibit hepatic gluconeogenesis, and stimulate appetite. There are two classes of sulfonylureas first generation and the second generation. First generation medications include tilbutamide, tilazamide and clopropamide. Second generation drugs are more potent than the first generation and are more commonly used today. These include glipizide, gliburide, and glimepiride. These medications are taken orally before meals to reduce blood glucose in type 2 diabetes patients. These medications can be used as monotherapy, or can be combined with other oral antidiabetics or insulin. And they have a glucose-independent action. Sulfonylureas are metabolized into their inactive metabolites by the liver and excreted in urine. Therefore, these medications must be used with caution in patients with liver disease. Common adverse effects include hypoglycemia, especially with the second-generation sulfonylureas, as they are more potent. Weight gain, due to stimulation of appetite, GI disturbances such as nausea, and allergic reactions like rash. On rare occasions, sulfonylureas can cause a severe skin condition, known as Steven Johnson syndrome. Moreover, first-generation sulfonylureas can cause a disulfiram-like reaction, also known as alcohol intolerance. This means that if a person takes alcohol while on sulfonylureas, he might experience symptoms like nausea and vomiting, flushing, dizziness, and headache. Next group of medications are the meglitinides, which have a similar action to sulfonylureas, where they bind and block the ATP-dependent potassium channels and subsequently increase the insulin secretion. These include repaglinide and nateglinide, both of which are taken orally. They are rapid-acting and have a shorter duration of action compared to sulfonylureas and are taken before each meal to reduce postprandial blood glucose level. Common adverse effects include hypoglycemia and weight gain. If a meal is missed, taking the drug should be avoided due to the risk of hypoglycemia. Last group of insulin secretagogues are the incretin-based drugs, which include two classes of medications, glucagon-like peptide 1 agonists, or GLP-1 agonists, and dipeptidyl peptidase 4, or DPP-4 inhibitors. Incretins are a group of hormones that are normally secreted by the GI tract in response to high glucose levels. They increase insulin secretion from the pancreas in order to reduce blood glucose levels. Major hormone in this group is GLP-1. GLP-1 agonists, like exenatide 
and liraglutide act on the same receptor as GLP-1 and exert their effects. These medications are given subcutaneously, and they stimulate insulin secretion, reduce glucagon release, slow down gastric emptying, and improve satiety. Common adverse effects include GI disturbances such as nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, weight loss, fatigue, hypoglycemia, and increased risk of pancreatitis. The next class of medications, DPP-4 inhibitors, include cetagliptin, vildagliptin, and soxagliptin. DPP-4 is a protease that breaks down GLP-1. As we have already discussed, GLP-1 is responsible for secretion of a large amount of insulin from the pancreas. DPP-4 inhibitors prevent the breakdown of GLP-1, thus, it can exert its effects for much longer. So, the effects of DPP-4 inhibitors are as same as the GLP-1 agonists. They stimulate insulin secretion, reduce glucagon release, slow down gastric emptying, and improve satiety. Unlike GLP-1 agonists, these medications are taken orally. Common side effects include GI disturbances such as nausea and vomiting, nasopharyngitis, headache, and mild urinary and respiratory infections. These medications do not cause weight gain or weight loss. So, they are weight neutral. As far as the contraindications go, these medications should not be used in hepatic or renal impairment, pregnancy, or breastfeeding.